is quite interesting because Alfred Nobel was an industrialist. He was certainly a good chemist, but he was most of all an inventor. And his most important inventions had to do with dynamite and gunpowder. He was actually not a very popular person in the country where he lived, which was France. Alfred Nobel was born in Russia, in a Swedish family in St. Petersburg. He lived only a few years in Sweden, then moved on to France and to Italy. And when he di finally died, that was in France. But two years prior to his death, his brother died. And there was an obituary in the French press. And as I said, Alfred Nobel was not a popular figure in France, so the headline for the obituary read, The Merchant of Death is Dead. Now that's, it's a bit unsettling to read your own obituary. And it's even worse, of course, if that obituary is critical of you. And it set Alfred Nobel thinking about what people were going to think about him after his death. And he realized that most of the things he had created were, well, weapons of mass destruction to him. And he decided he wanted to better his image of it. And he thought about creating prizes to celebrate science and culture and overall peace. Now, that turned out to be rather difficult, because when he finally died in Paris, all his assets were in French banks. And that meant that it would be very difficult to create a price in Sweden, since the French state considered this to be French money, because Alfred Nobel died without any heir. Now, Michael Silverman, who was an engineer working for Alfred Nobel, saw to it that the money was transferred out of the banks. This was mostly in, this was not in cash, of course, this was in stocks and bonds. And before the death of Alfred Nobel was announced, Silverman went around in a horse-drawn carriage collecting all the valuables from the various banks where they were deposited. And then he drove this carriage across Germany and into Sweden. Basically, he stole the French money. And this created a diplomatic dispute. Because it's one thing that it was relatively simple to move his money out of France, but it would be much harder for the Swedish government not to give it back to the French if they didn't have a good reason to keep it. Now, it turned out that there was a good reason. This is the home of Alfred Nobel in Sweden. He had a small country estate in the northwest of Sweden. This is taken at the height of summer and this is, of course, the reason why Alfred Nobel chose not to live in Sweden. In the height of summer in this place, well, that's as sunny as it gets. And you get, if you get 20 degrees, you're like, it's not a very nice and warm place to be. Paris is much nicer. Italy, where also Alfred spent a lot of time, is much nicer. But what is important is there was an ancient Swedish law stating that a man's home is where he keeps his horses. Now, of course, Alfred Nobel himself has been known to say that home is where I work, and I work everywhere. And Alfred Nobel was, was a true globetrotter. He was a true internationalist. But according to Swedish law, well, he kept four horses, Russian or of stallions, on his Swedish estate, and therefore by Swedish law he was Swedish. And therefore the Swedes kept the money. 
The French were not pleased. Moreover, this was just the beginning of the problems, because then came this, Alfred Lebel's last will and testament. And first of all, this is the original, well, it's, it's a picture of the original, I didn't bring the original. It's on the lock and key in the Nobel Museum. But what you notice about it, this doesn't really look like a valid legal document. It's got lots of changes in it. He changed his mind several times. Now, you may not be able to read it, so I have, let's see. Ah. So I've taken an excerpt of the most important part where it reads that he leaves to his nephews 200,000 crowns. Now that was a huge amount of money at the time. 200,000 crowns, that's not bad. They should be happy. <coughs> the crown is about 10 rupees. So even today, it's, it's, it's not all that bad. Uh, he also left to his nephew Emmanuel, 300,000, and to his niece Mina, 100,000. And to his brother, and so on, 100,000. What it doesn't say here is the fact that his entire estate was worth 35 million crowns. And this is, this was at the turn of last century. So before 1900. This was comparable to the gross national product of a small country. He was immensely rich. And the family received less than one million crowns. So they were, of course, incensed. And they protested this will very strongly. The Swedish king was very upset about the will. Not because of this, but because of what came later. Because here, in this paragraph, which still be, it may be difficult for you to read. It says that the whole of my remaining realizable estate, so that is in excess of 32 million Swedish crowns at the time, it should be given to prices to those who during the preceding year shall have conferred the greatest benefit to mankind. This was actually an entirely new idea. There were a few scientific prices around at the time, but they were all national. There were prices in France and in Great Britain, but they were only given to French and to Brits. Nobel's idea that it is my express wish that in awarding these prizes, no consideration whatever shall be given to the nationality of the candidate but the most worthy shall receive the prize, whether he be a Scandinavian or not. Now, there are two interesting things here. First of all, he, at this time, meant he or she. Alfred Nobel was not prejudiced when it comes to gender. Actually, one of the first Nobel Prize laureates in peace was a woman. And it was something that Alfred Nobel had intended all the time, which is Bertha von Suttner, who was uh, a very close friend of Alfred Nobel and whom he, who had worked very heavily for preventing the First World War. Now, that didn't work very well, but at least she tried. And that's worth, the effort was worth something as well. Um, but it's also interesting that he says, not Swedish, but Scandinavian, because this was a time when Scandinavianism was, was rampant, so there was a lot of relevant thinking among the Scandinavian countries. But Alfred Nobel said it shouldn't matter if, if this is a Scandinavian, it could be anyone. And this is something that the king was very upset about. Because, again, it was a lot of money, and the king was afraid that maybe it would be won by a foreigner, and it would leave the country. And first of all, it will impoverish the Swedish nation. Secondly, it will make us look silly and weak because we give away our money. And it took a long time of persuasion to get the king to actually accede to being part of the ceremony when the first Nobel Prizes were conferred. 
It's interesting that Alfred Nobel was very much ahead of his time here, and we can see that what, he's, what he created was something that was obviously a good idea. Now, actually, what he asked the prize committees to do is relatively easy. First of all, it should be prized to those who during the preceding years had conferred the greatest benefit to mankind. Of course, it's rather difficult to decide which has conferred the greatest benefit. But the important thing is that the price is retrospective. We are looking for something that has been done. Now, all senior scientists spend a lot of their time reading proposals. When we're not writing proposals, we're reading proposals. And that is really difficult, because then you are trying to judge the potential of someone to do something they haven't done yet. And preferably, it should be something that they do not know will succeed. Now, that is difficult, particularly when you are trying to assess young people for trying to fund it. That is close to hopeless. But this is easy. You look back and you see, anything good being done? Yes, okay, tick that box. Then, of course, to decide what is best and what is just so-so, that's more difficult. But at least a retrospective award is much easier than something that is written for. This part also makes it easier. The fact that the price should not take any consideration to nationality or race or gender or any such, it's not a popularity contest. It should be based on the results produced, nothing else. The criteria for the three prizes are stated in the will of Alfred Nobel, and they, they show both the time and the math. So in chemistry, it says discovery or improvement, because Alfred Nobel was a chemist. He was well aware of the fact that to do something new, it's pretty difficult because most things have been done in one form or another before, so improvement would be okay. In physics, it's discovery or invention. First of all, Alfred was not a physicist, so he believed that in physics there are surely many new things to discover. And of course, he was very lucky in that respect, because in the period immediately following the first Nobel Prize, physics exploded. And this is certainly one of the great reasons why the Nobel Prize became well known, because it managed to capture the growth of the new business. Invention, of course, because Alfred Nobel himself was an inventor more than anything else, and he thought that invention should also be possible to award on his price. And finally, in physiology or medicine, just discovery. And this gives you a picture into what medicine was like at the time. Every time a surgeon opened a patient, they saw something new. In fact, medicine was a vastly underdeveloped area of science at the time. And to make discoveries was very, very easy. Things have changed, but it means that the committees for physiology and medicine, physics, and chemistry work in slightly different ways because we have different criteria to meet. So here's a brief timeline for how it happens when a Nobel Prize is given out. The first thing that happens is that somewhere in the world there is a funding agency or a government that decides that it's a good idea to spend money on blue sky research. Because the kind of research that does get awarded by the Nobel Prize is something that is genuinely new. Genuinely new in the sense that it opens your eyes to a new set of possibilities. 
And this also means that very often the committee and the academy are heavily criticized because people who were involved in the development of the original idea and made huge contributions are not awarded. It's the person who just opened the door ajar who gets the prize, and then all the people who came afterwards and made it an important area are not. It's the discovery and not the development that is being awarded. That's one of the difficulties in awarding the prize, because you have to dig your way back to what you consider to be the precise moment when the discovery was being made. That is not necessarily easy, and it's not necessarily easy to get that right. The second thing that happens is that there is a scientist or a group of scientists who use that freedom to make a difference. And this is a very important message to all scientists, I think. And it doesn't have to do about the Nobel Prize. It has to do about courage. The fact that if you are left with freedom to do what you like, most of us tend to do something which we feel safe about doing anyway. We want to produce, we want to publish, we don't want to take too great risks. Because we don't want to lose that ground that we've got. And there is a great risk in this where we tend to be overcautious and play it too safely rather than reaching for the difficult fruit rather than the low-hanging ones. So it's not only a matter of funding free research, but a matter of getting there and actually daring to perform the free research, which is a different thing. And then finally, of course, it takes about 25 years before the Nobel Committee wakes up from its slumber and realizes, oops, there was something important. Let's give them some money. Practically, over the year, it works like this. In September, nominations are sent out. Because you cannot get the prize unless you have been nominated the same year. And there is a number of lists of people who are invited to nominate. So, first of all, there is a list of universities, about 2,000 universities all over the world, that, that receive this, not this letter every year. Now, it's different universities every year. So, this goes around the university of the world, which means that over a longer period of time, we should cover most of the institutes of higher learning in the world. Unfortunately, this method is not very, very effective <coughs> because it's sent to the university, not to a particular person. Well, it's normally sent to the vice chancellor of the university, but it doesn't mean that it ends up with the right people who can actually think about who should be nominated. Then, all previous laureates are invited to nominate. All members of the Academy of Sciences are invited to nominate. They are usually very bad at nominating. Uh, and then there is a relatively large number of scientists who are personally invited to nominate. And they are all asked to keep quiet about this, which means you're not supposed to tell the person you nominate that that person has been nominated. You're not supposed to tell anyone else that that person has been nominated. Which means that if you hear about anyone who says that he has been nominated or she has been nominated, well, then someone has spoken when they should be quiet. <coughs> In February, early February, the deadline for the submission of these nominations. And that means that in early February, there is a first meeting of the committee where all nominations are presented. So the first year that you sit on the committee, this is a rather daunting meeting. It lasts a full day, and 
Everyone else, of course, has been on these meetings before, and so there is a tendency that candidates tend to reappear year after year. It's not, we get about 600 nominations coming in. And, of course, out of these 600, I would say, I would guess, 500 appeared the year before. Um, and, of course, they cover areas which are similar, which means we will get different proposals for the same area, different names. But the important thing is that it's not entirely new when you have been on the committee for a while. But the first year, it's a scary thing. Because you wonder about the, the other people in the committee, how, how can they know all this? And of course they didn't the first year either. But it's a very educational experience to sit on another committee. Because you, you get to know about what's going on in chemistry and what the views of people around the world are concerning what is important in chemistry, right? Then we spend spring consulting with experts. Because the Nobel Committee The number varies, but it's about eight people. And certainly not superhumans, just ordinary university lecturers. Uh, we know a bit of chemistry, but we certainly don't know it all. Which means we need to consult with others. It's the only way to, to deal with this. And we need to consult with many people in order to get good answers. We also need to be able to guarantee secrecy for those people. Because if we go back to evaluating research proposals, normally seniors evaluate the proposals of juniors, and the very senior people will evaluate the proposals of the seniors. Now, the Nobel Prize candidate are as bad a senior as you get. And if you evaluate them and you give an unfavorable evaluation, you want to be pretty sure that it doesn't get make its way back to the person you make the evaluation of. That's why we guarantee that we keep our mouths shut for 50 years. And that's the minimum limit. If anyone involved in that area, in that yeah. price that was discussed, yeah. is still alive. Then 
have been out of the day in October, and all hell breaks loose, particularly for those who were chosen, and for the committee who gets lots of feedback. But actually, already in September, the committee holds its first meetings for the next year's prize. Because we know that many of the nominations that we got this year are going to reappear next year, and we discuss consultation already here. So this is when really the work starts for the year. And normally it takes quite a long time before we can reach a decision because we, make, we need to make many consultations. We need to think very carefully about the price. And this is, it's unfortunate because it means that it takes a long time before we can recognize something. And I would say that uh, one of the absolute prerequisites of getting the Nobel Prize is having a long life. If you die young, it doesn't happen. You know, there is actually, there is one absolutely surefire way to get the prize. There is one way, one thing that has worked perfectly. If your mother and father both receive the prize, then you will get it. <laughs> it has only happened once, and of course, it ends with all profit. So, and then in December, there's a big party and everyone is celebrating. But normally, this cycle is running continuously. And so it's like, it's like you need to reach escape velocity to get the prize. You need to, to do a certain number of turns in there before the committee and the academy feel that this is right for a reward. If we look at year in numbers, so we send out about 3,500 invitations to nominate, and we get back 600 nominations. And this is the key number. 600 nominations is about what we can handle with the size of the committee that we've got, and we really don't want to increase this. Um, I think it's a well-known fact that if you let a deciding body grow in size, although the number of wise people may increase, but the wiseness of the decisions don't necessarily do it. And the speed of decisions certainly doesn't do it. Uh, and since we, with, with the reply rate that we have, 3,500 limitations is the right number. If, we get declining numbers, we increase the number of invitations, and vice versa. The nominations cover typically 400 candidates. Uh, we will ask for external reports, say 30 of them, which will cover about half of the candidates. A good number of the candidates we will know enough about to be able to make our own suggestions. We write a number of reports concerning this. This will cover about three months of meeting time. Now that's, of course, not we don't sit in meetings three months at a time. This is three person months. So divide by eight can you get to the right number. And very importantly, I have a friend that wrote this in the paper and pulp industry. Everything is done on paper. We don't leave a digital trace. Um, we are well aware of the fact that once things are in digital form, they can and they will spread. So, well, Sweden is a great paper producer, so it's good for the company. Now looking forward to trends and challenges. First of all, this, this question about small and large groups. It doesn't say in the testament. In the testament, it says he. So the testament is sort of assuming that it's a single person who gets the reward. Very early on, it became clear that that is not a practical arrangement. But it became a precedent to have no more than three 
price limits each year in each suburb. This was fixed by the government in the 50s, so that today it can only be three individuals. There is a, a reason and an idea behind this. So it doesn't have to be actual individuals, it could be legal individuals, it could be companies, it could be organizations. And this possibility is used quite often by the Peace Prize Committee in Norway. Now, I do not envy the Peace Prize Committee. There is no more impossible task than giving away the, the Nobel Peace Prize. You're always going to get half the world saying, way, and the other half saying, no. The Literature Prize is equally difficult, but at least most people can relate to the price and of course we will all have our own ideas about another book that would be more worthy but most of the time it's it's someone who's written pretty good books or songs or poems but the reason it should only be three people is of course that we want the persons who get the prize to be recognizable. Because the whole idea of the prize is to put the spotlight on science. The person who gets the prize should become a symbol of what science can do. And in the scientific community, many of the Nobel Prize winners are rock stars, they're heroes. And they are very important role models for young scientists. If you give the prize to, say, sir, 4,000 people, it becomes very much more difficult to identify them. So this means that sometimes it's impossible to confer the prize because we can see clearly that this has been a gradual development where at least 20 people have made key contributions. That can never become a Nobel Prize. It should be something where you can identify at the most three persons. Now the question is, is that going to last? Will we be able to do that in the future? I'm off the committee now, so I can, I can speculate freely. I would say in chemistry, I don't think it's really that big a problem. In chemistry, we can normally find a way back to the original idea or the original experiment. Of course, as the area grows, many people get involved. And this is where the difficulty lies, because we are shooting at a moving target. If you, if you take the example of the recent prize for ultra-resolved microscopy, you could say it would have been better to wait until someone made a really important discovery using ultra-resolved microscopy. But then, three people had been involved in the development of ultra-high resolution microscopy. Now, if someone then makes a discovery using this, who is going to get kicked off the boat? So if you wait for too long, someone is going to make that discovery, then you're in real trouble, because then you, have, you really have to award the original technique first, and then the discovery is made by it. Or you have to wait for quite some time before you can, you can award someone who used that. So you are really moving along with the target and deciding on the moment when this would be a good time to award the target. So in that sense, we are defining the area in which the price is given, so that it gives you the right number of well-defined The second question, you really had to have to wait for 25 years. We are slow. Many say we are overly cautious. I like to express it like this. We, we will never give the Nobel Prize to the right people, but we try to avoid giving it to the wrong people. You can always say that someone else was more qualified, but if we have decided this is the area, this is the definition of this year's prize, 
we hope that we get the right people within that definition. Otherwise, we have made a great mistake. But if we pick something in organic chemistry instead of something in biochemistry, you can always make the argument that the other parts will be better. And there is no absolute justice in that. There is also the problem that every year there are many groups who are worthy of the Nobel Prize. We have many more candidates than we have prizes to give out. And there is no justice in that. It means that there will be things that we miss. And I think you can only think about it like this. There are many things which are defined as human rights, but getting the Nobel Prize is not one of them. <laughs> and finally, what is physics, chemistry, and physiology of medicine today? Uh, because what we see is an increasing interdigitation of these areas. And again, if, if we think about the, the, the price to super-revolve microscopy, you could claim that that is physics, you could say it's chemistry, you could say, well, the big uses will be in physiology or medicine. And four prices that involve several areas, we always discuss between the different Nobel committees. We don't block each other, but we inform each other. There is nothing to, there is nothing that says that the price couldn't be given in the same area to chemistry and physics the same year. It could happen. But if it happens, we want to know it beforehand. It would be very, very embarrassing if we announce the same price without knowing it. But then we don't really speak openly to each other, so it's, it's, a, it's a hide and seek game, where we, we tell a little bit and then we get an answer and then we start throwing the ball around. In great secrecy. So, the second question, the one about 25 years, I like to hide behind this. This is the Nobel Prize lecture of Jacobus van Hoff. So this is given, this is the first chemistry prize. This was given on the 13th of December, 1901. And I'll read it aloud because it's maybe a little bit too small to read. All those investigations on which I'm about to speak were carried out 15 years ago. This is the first prize. And what he got it for was made 15 years ago. I'm going to begin by describing still earlier studies, those which in fact form the basis of my own. The problem with scientific work is that it's very rare that a, a ready-made theory just appears like that. It's the result of a protracted sequence of experiments, calculations, speculations that you run over and over again. And most of the time, these are published as they're being made, which means there isn't really that singular paper to point at, but it happens over time. And then a coherent picture starts emerging in the scientific community that something important has happened in this area. There has been a shift of perspective. There has been something that perhaps is worthy of an adult price. Then we start working, trying to find our way back to where did the important transition take place, that non-tangible, gradual transition, and who drove it. And since it's taken, say, 10 years before it comes to that stage, there is a bit of detective work involved in finding out who was really involved. Because when something important is discovered, the number of people who consider themselves to be discoverers tend to be rather large. We forget history as it goes along. And therefore, it does take a bit of time. Not always. You may remember a few years ago there was another class in physics for the discovery of the Higgs boson. 
Now, that was work done in the 60s, but actually the experiment that proved the hypothesis was made the year before the price was confirmed. So there they were very good. Same thing with high temperature superconductivity, that price was given very quickly. Because it was easy to prove this is a unique new effect. We don't understand it, we don't know what it's good for, but it seems to be very interesting. Interestingly enough, we still don't know what it's good for, but it's still a very interesting discovery. This is what science looks like today. The areas are very much intermingled, but they enrich each other. And the way we see it in the Academy of Sciences is that we should be very inclusive. If an area can be thought of as belonging to chemistry or physics, then both chemistry and physics should look at it carefully. We want to give the prizes to the best achievements. We don't want anything to fall between the chairs. Of course, there are things that don't belong to either of these subject areas, but things that overlap should be treated and they should be treated fairly. And then the big question, well, you got that? <laughs> well, neither did I. We don't know. The decision hasn't been taken yet. Actually, the decision, the real decision is taken this year on the 4th of October, I think, half an hour before it is announced. This is one of the steps that we take in order to make sure that the price doesn't leak. There is a very short time window for leakage because the academy doesn't make its decision until the last day before the, the, all the press conference. But history is a good teacher. So we can guess from looking at what things have been, we may look forward. How many is the time? Okay. Time as in five minutes? Ten minutes? Five. Ah, okay. Good. So, first I would like to add a note of nationality here, because I will be stating nationalities of price winners. And these are nationalities as they are recorded on the homepage of the Nobel Foundation. And this means that the nationality of the laureate is given as their place of work at the time of the award which means that you may very well be born in one place, work in the second place where you actually make the discovery, and then you move to a third place and you get the prize and the third place gets very happy. Uh, so, for example, Ahmed Zavai is American, or was American. Venkat Ram Krishna, typical British name, he's British. <laughs> These are the first year of the 20th century. What I would like to point out here is that, first of all, the area. There is one biochemistry prize. The rest is physical, organic, nuclear, and inorganic. If we look at the map of the world, ah, there is something else that is interesting. There is also the first female recipient of the chemistry prize, Madame Gillette. If you look at the map of the world, you can see that at that time, the price was an exclusively European event. What is interesting to note is that today we often associate the Nobel Prize with the United States. Lots of American recipients. Well, there was one prize up till 1915. But you notice it's, it's a very small family group. 1915, when did, I don't know how to tell you about the prize. That was in 1913, exactly. So what you will see is that the literature prize has a very different map. Literature was much more in international than science at this time. If you look at physics, 
Physics also has a very different map. In physics, you have countries that are completely absent on the chemistry map, which are quite strong in physics. So this is a very skewed perspective for the chemist. And then you have the Great War and the, the interwar years. So a number of price, no, a number of years, no price at all was concerned because of the trouble in the world. But what we see is, of course, a lot of biochemistry. And Still quite a bit of physical chemistry, but if you look at the nations, Germany, UK, Austria, Germany, Sweden, Germany, Germany, UK, two American crises, nothing else outside of Europe. So up till 1945 or up to 1931, really, nothing happened. The picture is exactly the same. It's a very Eurocentric world. What really surprised me, I'll speed that out a bit, there we are. What really surprised me when I was composing this map, these maps was how long it took before this picture changed. Post war years up to 1959. Now, after the war, we all know that American science started going at a very high rate. And this, of course, should be obvious in the list of Nobel Prize winners. And, well, there are a few, but there is no dominance at all. There is the first Russian fight, but still, there is actually still dominance from Europe. And, let's get them all in place. You're getting a sizable collection up here, but it's nothing compared to what you put in Europe. And now we're at 1959. But the really big surprise is the 60s. Because by now, certainly, the very center of Nobel Prize should have shifted, shouldn't they? No, not at all. There are five American prizes during this time. There are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. European science. To me, that was a bit of a shock because I was born and raised with the notion of, of, of the US being the strong nation. It's, it's not true. So, this, was still, this was still dominated by Europe. And so that's the computer map picture after 1969. The 70s. Yes, we're starting to get more American prices, but it's pretty balanced. Are you as surprised as I was? Getting them on the map. And then finally, there it happens, the 80s. It's very, very recent. And it's all over the place. You have biochemistry, you have inorganic chemistry, you have structural chemistry, you have theoretical chemistry. What happened was that during the war, during the Second World War, it became very obvious in America that science was going to be important to be a major player in the world. Of course, the nuclear test was part of that. But it meant that America made great investments in science during the late 40s. And that's what paid off in the 80s. It tells you something about the scale of time. Because I said 25 years is a typical time. But that is oversimplified. 25 years is a typical time before we recognize the contribution. But it's very rare that a scientist makes this contribution in a vacuum. Normally the scientists that make the great discoveries are working in well-financed laboratories 
with lots of gill polyps. And to build these, to build these uh, creative environments takes a long, long time. Several generations of scientists. And it's a well-known fact that so having a mother and a father who got the Nobel Prize is that's the one hundred percent one. Having a supervisor who got the Nobel Prize is a very good way of getting it up. So you come into the right environment, you get the right ideas, you get the right kind of support. So the eighties we see an almost exclusively American uh, and then the nineties of course, same picture very dominated by the United States, very dominated by, by the softer kinds of chemistry, organic chemistry and biochemistry. And the map still looks pretty much the same, now getting much more weight on the American side. And then something happens again. So, after the millennium change, we see this, yes, of course, a lot of Americans, but look at this, Japan, 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 Israel, Israel, Japan, Israel. Now again, Japan made a statement, an official statement in the late 1970s that they had a research plan that meant that they wanted to get a certain number of Nobel Prizes during the first decade of the next millennium. They funneled money into particular areas where they wanted to get excellence. Now, you can argue whether that is a good idea or not, because certainly science is not about Nobel Prizes. Science is about education. Science is about the general level of education of people. Nobel prizes are just that that's that's an extra. But this is what was done in, in Japan and it paid off about 25 years later. With Israel this, the, the story is a somewhat different one. Israel made a very conscious effort to get people back. People who had worked for a long time in the famous laboratories particularly in Great Britain and in the United States and in Germany, and to make them come back to Israel and work there. So many of the prizes that were awarded to Israelis were awarded for work that was done abroad. But they had been recruited back. And what that meant was that suddenly you see these new areas appearing on the map. And if we look at what's, what's happened after that, so the years 2010 to 2016, we see still Japan and Israel featuring here. Of course, many American prizes, even the British prizes. But importantly, these nations have remained there. And clearly, that means something. Now, I want to finish by just discussing a few prices that I find particularly appealing, my personal favorites, if you want to put it like that. I would like to begin with this one, Green Fluorescent Protein. I like it because it contains a beautiful story. It contains a, a really fantastic discovery, and it also led to an important, an, an incredibly important technology. And all the three laureates had their part to play, which was necessary for this prize to, to become as important as it was. So, Osamu Shimomura discovered the green fluorescent protein as a side effect of something else that he was studying. He was looking at, at phosphorescence, or bioluminescence actually, from, from the uh, the Yellowfish Equoria uh, Victoria. And this story is absolutely fantastic. He was a self-trained organic chemist. He, he worked in a pharmaceutical institution in Japan, 
the first that opened after the war. He was actually admitted to medical studies at Nagasaki University, but when he got there, the town was gone. It's, it's, a, it's a fantastic story. The, the train tracks simply stopped, and there was a hole in the ground. And then he wandered Japan for a number of years before he got into this veterinarian uh, pharmaceutical training place. And he built up his own organic chemistry laboratory and studied bioluminescence in, in uh, marine animals, uh, managed to make some really breakthrough discoveries and got, got uh, an offer from the United States. And he went there. Uh, before he left, the university made him a doctor because he was a physician. And they thought it was embarrassing that he should leave the country um, to take up a position in the state when he didn't have a formal degree from his own university. So he discovered the effect of the green fluorescence uh, in this jellyfish. Martin Chalfi made a, a strange experiment which no one no one had thought about doing because it was simply too obvious that it wouldn't work. He took the gene that cloned for GFP and transferred it to a different organism, to, to a, a small worm. Uh, and everyone knows that, that bioluminescence is a very complex phenomenon where you need lots of cofactors and everything needs to work perfectly for bioluminescence to take place and therefore just taking the gene for this particular protein would never work, it works. And of course that meant that if you just would take this gene and put it into any living organism, it would become fluorescent. And that was put to great use by Roger Tien, who then developed the entire technology of multicolored proteins that are now being used in biomedicine as a fantastic diagnostic tool where you can follow production and activation of proteins in, in a manner that is absolutely impossible to think about before. This is also the background technique for, for the ultra-resolved microscopy that was applied later on. It's, it's, it's an enormously useful technique. But it's useful because all these different contributions came together. You know this map? Well, I'm, I'm sure you know what it is. This is, of course, Hamlet. Uh, the, 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 uh, the skull scene, it's Sir Lawrence and uh, You may know this man. Same scene. He didn't get the Nobel Prize either. This man did. This is Cheshman with the model of the Corsi Crystal. Uh, it's, uh, I find it interesting because of the journey that Cheshman made, because the discovery he made was something that everyone knew was false. And he had to fight for a very long time before people stopped laughing at him. Because it's such an obvious thing that bifold symmetry and crystallinity cannot exist together. It's in all the textbooks, you can prove it with mid-school mathematics, and you have to be an idiot to believe anything else. Well, this idiot happened to be very smart and very stubborn. And stubborn people tend to make good science. And finally, I have to mention last year's prize because there is such a wonderful element of playfulness in this. Now, here, this is about building molecular machines, much, much smaller than molecular machines of biochemistry. It's about what can we actually do and control in the small molecule world? How can we build machine elements and control their motion? And of course, out of these has come nano cars and things like this. Nothing very useful yet. Some memories with decent capacity, but nothing that beats what's being done by other technologies. But again, we're in this situation here. Uh, we're in this situation where when this starts yielding practical results, we will be 
great trouble if we hadn't awarded this prize. Because then how do you select the candidates? So these are the people who opened the door. There may be a prize in 20 years' time when someone has made something truly remarkable based on this technology. But waiting is one thing. Waiting for too long creates very much trouble. So you have been a very patient audience. I thank you very much. Some of you are still awake. You're all still here. Uh, and if you have any questions, I'll be more than happy to answer them. Which is some of them I will say I don't know. Thank you. This is simply because Alfred Nobel's will states physics, chemistry, physiology, medicine, peace, literature, and that's it, right? Uh, in the later part, economics was added, right? Uh, yes, economics, yes and no. So there is a price to the memory of Alfred Nobel in economics. Uh, it's not a Nobel Prize, but it is treated the same way when it comes to nomination, when it comes to the work that has been done around it, and it's being conferred at the same time. Uh, it is a member, let's say, of the Nobel Prize family. Um, I think it has been made very clear that it, it will be the only addition that has been made to the family. It's not, so it's, it's called the, the Prize in, Econ in Economy to Alfred Nobel's memory. What has happened then in the world is that many new prizes have appeared, and they have often taken exactly the role that you described, to give a prize in nanoscience, for example, computer science, uh, earth system sciences. And quite often, they have also chosen to say that the prize sum is the same as that of the Nobel Prize. So in that sense, I think, the, the area of these prizes are growing. But there is, I would say at the moment there is nothing to indicate that we get a new Nobel Prizes. There is also a limit to the funds that Alfred Nobel left behind. Um, what we can see is that the price sum was reduced in 2010 from 10 million to 8 million, simply because the price, the, the um, the money controlled by the foundation uh, is dependent on the, on the market. It's not sitting around in, in, in cash, it's, it's invested, and so when the general market goes down, so does the, so does the holdings of, of the Nobel sphere. Uh, and at the moment, I would say there isn't even a financial opportunity to give away more prices. Uh, but I would say it's handled by the rest of the world in a, in a very efficient way with the Millennium Prize, with the, the Carbon Prize, and we don't see this as competition. We see it as, as um, completion, where people have decided that this seems to be a good idea. Let's, let's do something along the same line. I just want to say that this is not an ethical question. This is just something about history. What exactly did Mr. Nobel have against mathematics? Sorry? What exactly did Mr. Nobel have against mathematics? Uh, ignorance. <laughs> I get it. There, there, is a, uh, there is a story that there was a, there was a an unhappy love affair involved, there is nothing to support that. Uh, it's very clear that there, Alfred Nobel had a very close relationship with, with Bertha von Suttner, but she was a married woman and they were not romantically involved. He was not interested in mathematics. <laughs> uh, he 
still got five to three years ago. <laughs> Remember, this was 1900. Uh, physics was still very much about calculus, 18th century mathematics. Chemistry was about plus and minus. The role of mathematics in sciences, to us it's so obvious that all science rests on a mathematical basis. <coughs> Much less so then. At that time, science rested on who could make the most precise measurements. That was the challenge. You're right, it's a historical question. It doesn't really say in 
happened to Bell's will that it shouldn't be given posthumously. Uh, it has been a tradition not to do that. It's not a tradition without exceptions, but the idea is that the prize, again, The prize should be useful. It should be useful in the sense that it puts the spotlight on a person. And it makes more sense to put the spotlight on a living person than someone who has passed away. Now, there are two very notable exceptions to this. One of them is the literature prize, which was a very long time ago given to a dead Swedish poet. Actually, at that time, the, the Swedish Academy of Letters decided that they went around the rules by giving it to the estate of the deceased poet. Dirty trick. They haven't done it again. The second instance was just a, a couple of years ago, uh, 2011, 2012, when one of the medicine laureates died after the decision, but before the announcement. So, in that instance, of course, when the decision was taken, he was alive. When the price was announced, he was dead. And at that time, there was a discussion concerning how that should be treated. And I think the Academy came up with the only reasonable solution, and that is to say, we have announced this price. We stand by our word. We can't say, no, oh, sorry, he died. <laughs> But the principle is that it's not given posthumously. I would say, if, if you want to have a simple explanation, I would say there are so many worthy candidates. Let's pick them among the living. If we start looking at the dead, there are a large number of them who we have missed, and should we start re-evaluating them, then we, I think we end up in lots of trouble. Why M.K. Gandhi did not win the Nobel Prize? Sorry, again. M.K. Gandhi did not win the Nobel Prize. If I understand it correctly, um, there was one year when there was no Nobel Prize given, there was no Nobel Peace Prize given, and that was the year that Gandhi died. I, since I don't know the inner workings of the Peace Prize Committee, I can only guess what happened. Um, I have I have no information, uh, but I, I am aware of the fact that there was a year when the, that it's not given to people who have died. Uh, I am convinced that he was high on the list, and I my personal guess is that he was on the top of the list, but and that year there was no right. But again, this is this is an uneducated guess. If you ask me about chemistry, we need educated guesses. <laughs> uh, but, but clearly, uh, this would have been one of the least contested peace prizes. That would be the simple one to give. So I'm convinced that it would have been hard for that. So you mentioned that it has to be given to at most three individuals. What if in any category there are more than that? Is it not given at all or is it competition? Sorry, get, get the question right. That if there are more than three, what do we do? Yes. Uh, well, there are. There is really just one way to deal with that. Uh, we we look at the area and we look at the nomination. And of course, it could be that we have defined the area in a way that is too broad. And we can narrow it down so that the number of individuals is more fitting. And of course, that could work if, if, if it's a very broad area and there are a number of towering figures in there. And we can say, well, we can aim it like this or we can aim it like that. Uh, if 
you have a large number of people who are close to each other, then that's not possible to do. That would be highly unethical to sort of try to draw straight lines just to, to exclude people. Uh, and then there will be no crisis at all. Again, there is no shortage of good candidates. Uh, and if you are unlucky to work in a field where there is gradual development for many people, because that's another part of it. If, if there are 10 people involved, each one has probably made a somewhat smaller contribution than if there is a single person. But it is, it does become impossible if the situation is too complex. So one more thing that in the times of 10 to 16, there were a few uh, people who had two, three or four nations in their list, list of nations. How is that possible? You mentioned that for a person, his uh, nationality has to be his work nation. Yes. So there are a number of people who have, this is another interesting trend in science today. And it, I think it's very well illustrated by the re-recruitment that are being done today, uh, particularly in China. It's very, very common that prominent Chinese scientists with positions outside of China get a second position in China, they get a second lab in China, and they work in both places simultaneously. And so there are a number of people who have multiple nationalities in terms of their working place. Um, I'm, I'm not certain that this is a good arrangement for most of us. Uh, it's difficult to keep two working groups together. I think it's pretty difficult to keep one working group together. <laughs> And, and to have to have to have labs working on the other side of the globe is not an easy thing to manage. But of course, if you have that arrangement and you make an important discovery, then you have to be noted as a person with two two scientific nationalities. Uh, personally, I think the the question of nationality here, I realize the importance because of the of the hero nature. Of course, the, we all look to, to, to see who are the great scientists of my country, who are the great writers of my country, and they achieve a hero status. At the same time, science should be about internationalism. Science, good science, good groups of scientists tend to be multicultural, multi-ethnical. It's because you, come to, you have different ideas, you have different ways of working, and that's normally that leads you forward. Uh, but in the end, this is just the way that the Nobel Foundation presents the nationalities. In most places, people tend to, to say that, well, this is our person. He is not English, he's Indian, right? <laughs> And your time is up. Okay, let's thank Professor John Levine for his insight. So now we will request our honorable director, Professor Chakravarti, to hand over the mic to Professor Levine.